Um, specifically when you're dealing with multi-site, because um, that is uh, the generally of the um, And by the way, this is going to be a fairly developer-oriented talk, but I'm not going to go too much into code. Um, at least time we're Q&A at the end, so you guys will go over more code, and specifically how we're doing things. Um, there's also that link at the bottom. Slides are already posted there, um, and there's some resources in that GitHub repo. I'll be adding more after the talk as well. So when I first got to the BDN uh, five years ago, there was a one-person development team, which was me. Uh, we didn't really have sophisticated um, setups in how we deployed things, so there was a lot of cowboy coding. Um, and a lot of that, that, that resulted in a lot of a lot of hurt feelings. And so this is sort of um, how the workflow went, which is I have a great idea for something, and I code it, and ship it right to the website. Um, there were things would just burn down. Um, and then uh, the staff at the bottom would be angry, they'd want to kill me, and um, I would end up smoking a lot to try and kill my neuroses. Um, and so eventually, you know, after this happened a couple hundred thousand times, we decided, well, maybe we should actually, like, I should have a whole development environment of my own. So I set up a development environment and uh, mostly tried to mimic as much as I could the live site and um, what was on it. But it wasn't perfect, and sort of what happened is I'd have a great idea for code, and I'd bang it out and I'd write it, and sometimes I'd ship it to my local development environment, which was just the worst. It was slow. We didn't fully replicate the environment that we were working on. Um, and it was sort of, I don't like bananas, it was sort of like eating a um, And then, so we wouldn't really do the testing. We'd ship it to the live site. Things would burn down. Everybody would be angry, even angrier than before, because I was like, hey guys, I fixed our development process, and gave them hope, false hope. Um, and so finally, uh, we came around to a development process that I think works pretty well, where um, I have a good idea for code, we write it, we maybe test it locally, actually not always test on myself locally, but we always, always, always test it on our staging environment, uh, which is fast, easy to access, uh, always up to date, and really well replicates our production environment. Uh, it's always tested there before it's shipped to production, and uh, now, of course, everybody loves me um, at a store. Uh, <laughs> so, sort of the problems that we run into, that I run into, I think a lot of other people run into with staging and local dev environments. Um, first of all, I think everybody knows it's really, really hard to do actual work against false data, against either placeholder data or stale data. Um, and at the BDN, you know, we've got a couple hundred stories a day going on the website. Um, everything changes very quickly. Even sort of harder is dealing with old settings. Um, the number of times that I've deployed something and then walked away and came back and it wasn't working. And what's going on though is because I developed it against this set of expectations that is no longer true. It was true a month ago or two months ago when I synced my database. Um, slow stage environments are a, a real killer. Nobody likes to test against a slow environment. And um, so our database is um, well over 10 gigs, I think 12 years. Um, and so, it's like, you know, I only have so much memory in my computer, um, I'm not going to devote 16 gigs worth of RAM just to running a MySQL server so I can uh, test things. Plugin disparities, again, you know, you depend on this plugin and you thought it was activated on the main site and it's not, or vice versa. Um, it wasn't activated on your staging environment, you push apply, oh, there's a conflict. Uh, managing branches is also sort of a pain. If you guys um, are using branch version control, um, which we started doing recently, unless you have a good tool for managing that process, you know, if you're testing on a staging environment and every time you commit, you have to go on the staging environment and like do a git pull or an SKF, that's not fun. Um, and then to make it all worse, if you're developing multi-site, it's just end of the world. There are, there are some tools that make developing for single site sort of feasible. Multi-site sort of puts a hole in all of this. Um, and there's even more problems that we won't go into, um, but we're going to solve all of these today. So the first one is, as I said, unless you really, really like hating yourself, um, 
dating sites really need to be so easy to use that you can't avoid using them, that you have no excuse. And there's, if, if they're not fast, if they're not up to date, there's always an excuse that it's things get out right away, and I don't have time to fuss around with these So the first thing is, your dev environment should be as close as possible to your production environment, but also not so not the exact same. There are things that you're going to want to be different. Um, and so an example for us is object caching. We have persistent object cache on our live site using MetaCache D, which is awesome. But we don't want that on our local site where we actually don't really want the options to persist. We want to be able to change them and not have to flush the cache every time. Um, we also have things like um, page caching on our production site. That's not cool um, for your local environment. We have uh, database load balancing on the production site. Again, we're not going to test with multiple databases unless we're actually testing a specific change to that environment. And um, so the way that we've worked around that, this is the most simple incarnation, is to define something very early on in your WP config um, that just says, hey, this is a local dev environment. If we're on an end of your code later on, you can say if we're developing locally, don't either do or don't do this thing. Um, so, this is an example. Our object cache, I don't know how many people are familiar with, with drop-ins, but object cache.php is a drop-in that you can put in your WP content directory that will load in your persistent object cache. Um, and so we say in object cache.php, instead of having all the code to load up the persistent object cache, we say, is this the dev environment? If it is, don't load the object cache. Else you can actually get even, um, this is code that I stole from Mark Jacob, you can get even more complicated with this. What he recommends is having a local config.php file. So if your WP config is in version control and you're modifying that to uh, add your um, WP as local dev or any other variables, we've done this before, have stuff that is only meant for local environments and then accidentally commit it to production. Um, and then things happen. Um, so you can put this code in your WP config. It says, if we have a local config file, first of all, we are developing locally. So let's set that variable that we can use later on. Um, and in your local config file, you can do things like you can define your um, local staging database. You can define, um, you know, turn on WP debug, for example, if you want. Um, do any, define any variables the way that you want them to appear uh, locally, and then everything else is in that WP config for production. Uh, so I grabbed this from, and again, these links are all um, at that link, but I grabbed this from Mark Jacob, who's one of the core developers, and uh, who's done a lot of work on making things run easier locally. So that at least gets us started down the path of allowing us to configure two very similar, but purpose-focused environment in order to run our code. We then run into this multi-site problem. And um, I don't know, is everybody familiar with these first two um, constants that we define up here, WP site URL and WP home? If you put these in your WP config, um, or somewhere else that's loaded early on, such as your uh, local config, what it's actually going to do is it's going to override um, your WordPress install so that if your website is macrodailynews.com and you want your local dev environment to be medianlocal.com, um, you can define these to medianlocal.com and if you go to medianlocal.com instead of redirecting you to macrodailynews.com, which is probably uh, something that everybody's familiar with, it'll rewrite basically everything to be medianlocal.com. It doesn't update it in the database, it just allows you to develop locally using that URL. And that's handy because we've also had instances where if you're editing your host file to uh, switch your the pointer for your development environment to backerdelius.com now points to my local host. That's great until you think that you're on your development environment and you go on and you publish a nice little post that's like, why the fuck isn't this working? <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a call. Um, and so this helps you get around that. The important thing is it doesn't work with multi-site. So the next thing that we decided was, well, what we'll do is we'll just, when we're developing locally, uh, we'll just disable multi-site, and we'll just run all our code like it 
it's a single site. Uh, and then we can define our MVP site so going on MVP home. That doesn't work either because we have all these functions that uh, require these multi site, um, that multi site is being loaded. And if you define this false, WordPress to be not loaded doesn't load all this code. But now all of a sudden we have fatal errors along with this. So that didn't really work out well either. And I mentioned the problems with editing your host file. Um, and so this is sort of what, you know, if you're editing your host file every 10 minutes because you're switching between live site and production site, it's, it's really a pain in the ass. So this is what we came up with. Um, this is one way around it. Mark Jacobith, again, wrote this really cool Ruby program uh, meant to run an OS X uh, that just gives you easy access to editing your host file. And so you can do things like uh, local dev at pegamillions.com, and it'll point pegamillions.com to your local host, and then local dev remove pegamillions.com, and it'll remove pegamillions.com from your, from your host file. Again, that's great until you forget, and then um, you're sort of screwed. So we wanted an easy solution that would basically take pegamillions.com and rewrite it to our local, a local URL, whether it's um, stage.com or dev, and the way we're going to do that is with a file called sunrise.php. And they may play around with sunrise.php in here before. Okay. Um, so sunrise.php, when you're loading WordPress, first thing is everything gets index.php. It loads at wp-blog-header.php, which really does nothing except load wp-load.php. wp-load calls your config wp-config. So that gets all of your variables that you're defining, like your MySQL host. Um, and wp-config.php at the very end says, you know, this, that's it, pencil down or something like that. Stop editing here. And the last line is to load wp-settings.php. So wp-settings.php loads just the very most basic parts of WordPress, parts that you can't run without. Um, and so it defines some additional constants that you have to define in your wp-config. It loads core functions, um, things like the um, uh, the apply filters uh, functions. Uh, it loads the plugin API, but not the plugins. So it's basically just the code for, for loading the plugins. It loads the database class and connects to the MySQL server. And it initializes the cache. But nothing has really happened yet. And so the next thing it does is load sunrise.php. And here you can really hijack WordPress. You can do whatever you want with WordPress at this point if you so desire. And we do. So um, we're basically going to trick WordPress into thinking that um, bdnsage.com is the site that this trying to load. And so if you're using multi-site, there's a table that's um, defined in code as WPTB blogs. Um, and so your default table will be something like WP underscore. And when you're loading up WordPress, it looks at the HTTP host that's being loaded at the, at the moment. And then it does a MySQL query, select from WPDB blogs where domain is this domain. So it then puts into uh, the global scope things like the blog ID, a blog object, a uh, site object, a couple other things. And we can actually do that for it, and we can change the behavior. Um, so in this case, what we're doing is we're taking the HTTP host. Uh, we're basically doing a string replace from um, I got that backwards. Sorry, live.com to stage.com. So if our the site that we were trying to load was mysite.live.com, uh, stage.com, um, it would then replace that. So it's looking for mysite.live.com, load that um, from the database, and then we put it in the global scope. Um, so now all of a sudden. All of the sites that I used to have to load by either hostnaming and going to pyramidlinux.com, I can now just have, say, everything bdnsh.com goes to my host file, um, and it's immediate switching. It's going to pretty seamlessly operate between those two. This is also, for anybody who uses multi-site, this is the exact same code that we use for doing domain mapping. So if somebody has a, a top-level domain, you need to use the same sort of trick, and it's the exact same. Uh, and again, that's on GitHub right there, and it's linked in that, in that plug. Uh, 
so managing branches. Um, again, we're having that same problem of it's not easy if, if every time I'm pushing code, um, maybe it's I forgot a semicolon or I misspelled something. Um, I'm going to make that code, I'm changing code, I'm going to commit it. Do you really want to have to then SSH into your server, um, navigate to the directory, do a git pull, make sure you're on the correct branch? It's a lot of work. So there's an easier solution. Um, this tool was developed by the folks at Fusion. Um, and what it is is just a little graphical interface right in your WP admin bar that allows you to switch branches and keep your branches up to date. So you can see here in this GIF, we're on um, second, there we go. we're on this issue 316 YouTube on blogs branch. We just switched to WC boss. Um, and now does the get pull for you, make sure the code is up to date and also running on that, the code on that branch. So when we have um, code that we want to deploy, we use GitHub, you can use whatever you'd like. Um, when we have code that we want to deploy, we say, hey, Garrett, I just pushed this code to this branch. All Garrett has to do is go to the staging site, um, switch the branch, code's there, he can test it, he can say, well, you done screwed up. Um, or this looks perfect, and then merge it. Um, very low barrier of entry. Um, so that plugin again is right there. GitHub.com. Touch any lock your to get switch. Um, really changed our workflow for the better. So this is where we get to the part about our huge, huge database. Um, and without getting too much into specifics about how databases work, if you're using NoDB. Um, as your database engine. Um, what, one of the things that it's going to try and do is load, basically load the entirety of the database into memory, otherwise it's just dreadfully slow as a database engine. What that means is you have to have all that memory available, and we don't want to have, we don't want to pay for a huge pumpkin database server just for running our staging site. We don't want to take up all the memory on our local computer. Um, you also run into the issues of you want to keep your staging in a very local dev environment up to date. If you have a big database, it's really slow to move around. Our database can take upwards of an hour and a half to move over, even a pretty decent, decently sized network connection. Um, and you want to make sure that the plugins that are active on the live set are also active on your, your staging environment. Um, so you can do this several different ways. At the BDM, we have actually we take hourly database dumps um, of our website, back them up to a local server. Um, once a night, we take that very last database um, and push it up to our staging site and import it. So this is, um, let's go down here, this first uh, map script is just dumping out the file to uh, 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 doing a MySQL dump of the database to a file that's named by the hour. And then at midnight, we say take the file that's based um, on this day and this hour and push it up to the server. Um, once we have it on the server, this is where the real fun begins. Um, so we unzip the database, uh, we import it to the database, um, and then we delete all of this stuff that we don't want. So we're probably developing against pretty recent uh, content. We don't need, we have stuff going back to 2019, um, which makes it huge. So we get rid of things like um, posts, post meta, um, and comments for um, articles that are older than a couple months. Um, we get rid of those term relationships as well. Um, we get rid of things like we have this WP email table um, that's just huge. It's like every email that was ever sent on the site. And we don't need all of that data. It's great to have, but we don't need it um, in our development environment. Um, and other various things like, you know, for us, this WP 131 posts table is just a huge table that we never develop against. That gets our database down from 12 gigs to something like 1 gig, which is much, much more manageable. And then we actually dump the database back out, uh, zip it up, and leave it on that server so that anybody can grab it down to the local dev environment. Um, and then this last thing is we use WP Fly to activate it. Those simple steps, and that was what, like five things. Those simple steps have taken us from never using our staging environment to using it religiously. We, the only time we ever push code directly into production is when the site's already broken. Say, all right, forget it. Um, but it takes.
takes maybe two minutes now to actually take a branch, um, check it out using that GUI, um, review the, the performance of that code, make sure it's doing what it says it's doing, um, and then continue on. So um, I can do some code demos now. Um, I also, I didn't get into a little, uh, some people might be interested in talking about um, big rent and that sort of stuff. It's interesting. Or I can go over um, more about how we actually implemented these and we'd like to see the code. Questions? Okay, I think. Um, so are you uh, just using Vagra for your local environment? Have you looked into uh, like Docker or anything like that? Oh yeah, Docker for a local environment. That would be uh, Brave Soul. Uh, <laughs> It varies uh, actually among the team. Um, so I just got a new computer um, a couple days ago and I'm setting up a rate on this one. Um, Pierre actually uses uh, the same, he uses Ubuntu for his local computer. Um, so he doesn't really have to go through the process of, he just develops locally um, and has that to next running right on this machine. Um, there's a great library though, varying favorite favorites. Um, which was developed by the folks at Tenop, right here local. Um, that makes getting a WordPress environment set up in Baker very, very quick and very simple. Um, and I included that in our in our list of resources as well. Um, it definitely it behooves you to not have the same environment locally that you're developing on uh, production. It, with us, we get around it a lot by having a safety environment that's set exactly the same. It's the exact same um, Linux version, exact same Nginx config, exact same, almost exact same MySQL config. Um, but the number of times that we've had a problem on the site, and we've spent hours digging into, well, is this like some sort of weird configuration difference between how the locals configured and how the production's configured? Uh, we've done that a lot. Um, so definitely recommend favorite. Uh, unless you're really feeling great about what you're talking about. <laughs> what do you use? Uh, I mean, I use Vagrant now, but uh, I'm getting into like Docker and getting all that set up with like local yeah. and then production and <laughs> as well. So, yeah, I was wondering if you have dabbled in that at all. <laughs> <laughs> great. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you use uh, several plugins and
this is going to be pretty easy to say. If you're, you know, higher or less than this commit, do this thing, else don't do this thing. Um, and that's basically how WordPress installs work. Is they um, they store the database, uh, a database version, and there's a code version. And when you're running the install script, it says um, if you know it just compares. But I would just generally recommend you away from that. Okay, well, I guess the you know, part, part of my question is if you're you know working on working on a site and making changes to options or settings or oh, so you can plug in like an interface with fields. So you're creating new fields and they have values. So there's a tool called, um, if you're doing like sort of database changes like that, staging database changes locally, there's a tool called Ramp um, that a lot of people use to do that. Um, and I haven't used a person I've heard it works very well. Um, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's not very cheap, but it's supposed to work very well. So for us, um, we make those changes on production and then wait for them to trickle down to um, the dead environment. So if, you know, it might be that we have to push that code and then wait for it to be on production. It's not that long of a week, um, and um, it just makes us feel secure that we're a, not forgetting anything because you know, there, I, there should just be one master that you can all against in our in our experience, um, and that master for us is always production. Production is always true. Any changes made on the local can never be assumed to have been made on production. So if their databases database changes, we want to make those and then watch them sit down and make sure. That I think you said this, but so your your focus is on the WP content directory of the of the multi site. Uh, sorry, I think my your Git repo consists of the WP content directory. Is that no, not not all the images now? Okay. I, I think he was just asking for the plugins and themes. So what is in your Git repo essentially? What file structure? So our Git repo is all of the code, um, and we oh. we have the WordPress WordPress as a Git repo um, that syncs pretty regularly with um, the subversion. The core and everything. The core and everything. Um, again, making sure that we're always on the same, um, always on the same code. When we, when it comes time to upgrade WordPress, what we do is we create a branch, do a pull from the external Git repo, go into um, our staging site, do a Git switch, and then test everything there. Um, so it keeps it very neat, tidy, and separate until we're ready to do that merge. That's our done right uh, so I think there was one on back there first. Um, also, off of that, how do you sync your uploads folder if you do at all? Sorry, I can't quite hear you. How do you uh, sync your uploads folder if you do? Oh, good question. Uh, the question was, how do we sync our uploads folder? Um, this is another Mark J. Wood trick, actually. Um, so we have a uh, multi-server environment. We have uh, four or five web servers um, and a couple database servers. And they're actually spread out across different hosts. And obviously, we don't want to be um, pushing our content around every time somebody uploads an image, which is pretty very regularly. Um, so what we actually do is we have one true um, master for all of our media uploads. And um, in our load balancer, we define any time somebody's requesting to go to the WB admin, send them to this server cluster here. Um, if any of the other, I can actually show that to you guys as well. <laughs> um, so if any of the other web servers get hit from an ASIC request that doesn't have, what it's actually going to do is proxy pass this um, to that server that has all of the assets. Who doesn't have it? Oh, bigger. Thank you. Um, so what we're doing right here is we're saying for any of these files, first of all, we had access expire centers. Um, but we, we try it at that URI first, see if it actually exists on that local server. If it doesn't, which would be most of our image assets, um, it actually passes that over to that server that has all of the images. Um, so that way we don't have to worry about keeping them synced on the servers. Um, you know, we also use the CDN, so we actually hypothetically shouldn't be getting that many um, JPEG, you know, request for image assets, I think that's in that WP class about this directory. Um, but if we do, that's how we can do it. That answer your question? Yeah. Um, did you still have that? Um, yeah. I actually have a certain question for you. Yeah. 
Chain uploads things on multiple servers. We leverage Amazon Web Services uh, auto scaling groups, so we can't trust that a server is always going to be there to have that master copy. Yeah. Um, there's a really awesome plugin called um, Amazon S3 and CloudFront that will take those media uploads and push them directly to S3 uh, and then uh, rewrite the, the string in your database so it automatically points it to CloudFront so it doesn't need to live or point to a specific server. Great, so um, in case anybody can hear him, um, when you're dealing with um, Amazon Web Services, um, if you want to use S3 to store your, your images, there's a plugin. What was it called again? Amazon S3 CloudFront? Amazon S3 and CloudFront, yeah. Amazon S3 and CloudFront. <laughs> and so what it'll do is when you upload an image, um, it'll actually send that image to S3 um, and then rewrite the location of the image in your database um, so that it's always pointing to the S3 URL instead of to your local WordPress URL. Uh, so, yeah. Just, um, Thank you all for coming.